So the nice S chassis has a motor in it now, and um, this man can tell you probably everything you need to know about a 2J. So I'll just shut up and have Chris explain a bunch of things about this motor because it's his own car. Um, yeah, what's the deal? Uh, so this is just a 2JZ GT, uh, VVTi. We just built it, it's got a factory crank, uh, manly I-beam rods, the turbo tufts, and then uh, manly pistons. 86 and a half millimeter, uh, we use Total Seal gapless rings. Yeah, the Total Seal. I never heard of that company, but like it seems to be really good though. Total Seal, they're, they're huge. They make a ton of, they make uh, incredible products, like I said. And uh, um, you actually order manly pistons, and they come factory with uh, oh, Total man. Seal top rings. Oh man. So a lot of companies offer it as an option. Almost every piston manufacturer op offers it as an option. Um, some come standard with them. Uh, they make a, a great product. Cool. Obviously, there's you know they have there's more cost-effective ways for them to get you know uh, rings made overseas and stuff like that. So usually your standard ring packs aren't uh, aren't as high quality. Uh, but yeah, Total Seal makes a phenomenal product, and this is actually a gapless set. Uh, so it's two top rings that interlock with each other. Right. Um, and then you you face the openings opposite direction, so there's absolutely no gap in the top ring. Um, so this is a pretty standard setup. Uh, this car wasn't set up to make. Uh, it's my personal car, so you know, like, uh, uh, I'm not looking to make a lot of power. Um, you know, four or five hundred horsepower, maybe five fifty is kind of my sweet spot, maybe. Yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes less. So sometimes I even turn the boost down. I really like driving uh, more aggressively and having to really, you know, uh, force the car around a little bit more if I can help it. Yeah. Um, it's got. Um, we really didn't do a lot to this motor, uh, you know, except for parts. You know, like uh, we did oversized valves. Right. Uh, pretty standard. Anytime we do stainless valves, we always do uh, bronze guides. It's pretty much mandatory. Uh, powdered metal uh, just doesn't uh, have enough lubricity, doesn't hold, retain oil as well. Right. Um, and when you run a more aggressive material like stainless, uh, they don't last. So you have right. to do stainless valve or bronze guides with stainless valves, uh, exhausts or ink canal. Uh, this one, I believe, is a super tech setup. Um, not my favorite. We use SuperTech buckets. Uh, we wanted to try their product. It's a shim under bucket setup. Right. Uh, since my car wasn't as aggressive, we were willing to try it. Um, not something I would really recommend or install. Like I like SuperTech. I love their parts, but and I understand the simplicity of stocking shims yep. versus buckets. Right. It's a lot cheaper to stock. It's a lot simpler to swap things out. They just use a standard eight millimeter shim, uh, which can be found even on like motorcycles and stuff and. Yeah, uh, it makes it very simple, but um, you still have a shim, and if you can eliminate the shim, it's a lot more reliable. Uh, granted, there's some sort of major failure or issue, and um, the reinforcement to be able to have the shim uh, be removable makes the bucket larger. So you kind of lose some of uh, the advantages of going shimless bucket, where you take some of the reciprocating weight off of the valve train. Right. Uh, but it's got. Um, what Super, cams are you running Supertech, in? It's got tech Springs, retain, titanium retainers, and then Kelfords. Kelfords, uh, They're yeah. just a mild Kelford. Uh, like I said, again, like I'm not looking to make a lot of power. Uh, I'm not revving it super, super high. Right. I'm looking for something that's got a little bit more response in mid-range. Right. Um, so we're running a Kelford. I believe it is like a 264 right. uh, in that range. Uh, Kelford makes uh, amazing products, incredible, the profiles, everything. Uh, because you see a lot of guys go to BC and all that stuff for, for the 2Js. It's almost like synonymous with 2J for a lot of people. Uh, BC does a very good job of marketing and they're cost effective. And you know, I think a lot of people like to try cost things that are more cost effective. Sometimes they want to just figure out if it's going to work. And yeah. you know, it works for a lot of people. Um, I, I think that uh, BC's come a long way in terms of quality control. I'm not as opposed to working with BC products today as I once were. Uh, but you know, like uh, sometimes it leaves, does leave a sour taste in your mouth. Like I said, there is some quality control issues and yeah. things like that. Because everybody used um, to run like HKS cams. Like it was like, I never heard anything like 10 years ago. All you ever heard was HKS that people ran in Europe in their cars. If there was some like magical method for making something cheaper that worked just as well. Yeah. Everybody would do it. And everybody's parts would be the same price. Yeah. You know, sometimes like uh, when something's too good to be true, it is. You it know? usually and, uh, is. Yeah. So... But for the most part, they make a quality product. Like I said, I think there's a place for it. Yeah. Um, and, and BC makes a decent product and we sell their products. And 
we support their products in, in certain applications. Yeah. But there's certain applications where, you know, um, we don't, you know, where I, where I steer away from them. Um, you know, and it, it's just kind of uh, situational in that sense, you know. Like in this situation, like we're using um, market cam gears. Uh, we didn't even degree these. It's a standard um, 2JZ cam gear. Yeah, you're we just, I just didn't really care. Like this was kind of like a basic motor, like a simple motor. And I just wanted to make sure that I bought a quality cam where I wasn't have to worry about dowel alignment and things like that. Yeah. There's probably a little bit of power there that I'm missing out on, but yeah, um, I just prefer to like leave it. Like I said, it's my car and, I, and, I, and it's never going to see more than 500 horsepower and kind of I guess building it kind of, uh, build, running a built motor for me was a little bit of uh, in excess. Yeah. of what I, I originally intended to do, but we had some problems with some tuners and things like that where yeah. um, they forgot to set up some fail safes or oh, yeah. uh, boost cuts and things like that. Oh, that was a problem. If they forgot before. boost cut? Yeah, I, I, I went out and I asked for 18 PSI and I wound up coming off the dyno at 24 oh, and man. I was pretty upset about it. Oh, um, yeah. I went to the track and grenaded that motor within a lap and it actually wound up making uh, close to 36 pounds of boost. Jesus. That's <laughs> so a, I wasn't, it's a pretty B, pretty fast motor at that time. Yeah. So yeah, I have the fuel system for it. You know, the car has the fuel system to support yeah. those kinds of figures. I run 1750s. Um, I and what, you're, what, what fuel are you going to be? You have flex fuel sensor or are you going to be running ethanol base or? Yeah, I, I, we pretty much, I pretty much run E85 pretty exclusively. Uh, and we run pump 85, so the cheap stuff, you know, right. uh, it's very expensive. Oftentimes it's, it could be a little bit less than even premium gasoline. Yeah. Uh, it's very unstable, very unreliable. Uh, sometimes you go to the pump and it's like E50 something. And sometimes I go to the oh, pump, man. it's E85, yeah. E90. Uh, it's definitely more on the low end. It usually hovers around E70, uh, but sometimes you just get bad batches and it's all over the place. Yeah. Uh, so to combat that, I run um, a flex fuel sensor and then um, I use a fuel cell. And in this case, I use a fuel cell. I try to use like factory fuel systems as much as I can. Um, but I try to make to make sure because uh, they all seal so well. But like I said, in this car I was showing you that I used uh, the factory filler neck, right? Uh, factory yeah. vent, yeah. Uh, using the gas cap vent, yeah. Um, I just use there's little things that I just do to make sure that my my tank seals up well, so I don't have to worry about evaporation and sludge and things forming. And they run some really high end uh, large uh, multiple filters yeah. in line. So from the fuel tank to the surge tank, and then from the surge tank back to the motor. Uh, so we filter really well. We and haven't had any problems. Is it in your experience like really needed? Can you like tell from the filters that it's like necessary to run it? Because like there's a lot of problems that we see in Europe with E85 with people having problems with it. It's also like they leave the car sitting around for a month. And I think that like, so I think the big thing for me is like uh, sometimes people's fuel systems are set up incorrectly or they're venting, venting them incorrectly uh, and they let them sit. And what happens is it evaporates really fast. Yeah. And then what doesn't evaporate condenses down. Right. It could turn into sludge, right? Right. Um, if you have the proper like check valves, good fuel pumps with check valves, so that way it's like not depressurizing and leaving air in your system yeah. when you're parking your car. If when you set your sit in your car correctly, I've even had inline check valves that we've used before uh, with a little bit of failure. Um, you know, we have fuel filters that there's fuel filters that have check valves built into them. So we have a lot of fail safes to right. make sure that we don't get immediate drain back of fuel. Right. We lose pressure. Right. Uh, pressure will taper off, but not completely. Right. Uh, so that way we're not draining that back and allowing air to get in the system, which is allowing uh, evaporation and things like that to happen. So with all those things combined, um, basically we just keep like kind of like an airtight sealed uh, system. And like I said, I tell, I've told you this before, like, you know, on some of my cars, like my, my GTR, you know, that car sits three months at a time. Sometimes yeah. I just don't drive it. I just don't. Uh, you know, I get in the car, fire it right up, and drive, and, and I run exclusively on ethanol. Crazy, um, yeah. You know, and uh, it, it's just, it's very simple for me because uh, with ethanol, with blending, and if I have to, I could go put 91 octane in my car. Uh, with, with the map blending, I, I don't have to do anything. It's, it's just, it's very effortless. Right. Um, so um, that's kind of my preference. Uh, it runs cooler, it's readily available to us, and it's very inexpensive. And, um, just gone through the process of doing little things here and there to kind of change it, you know? So yeah. like this car, like I said, I'll utilize the factory venting. I'll put a brand new gas cap on it and that'll seal my tank. And we'll run filters with check valves to make sure the, the uh, fuel can't bleed off right away. Um, and then this thing will sit in between events 
full feet, full of ethanol yeah, and right. uh, I'm going to get back in it. It's going to fire right up every single time yeah. and I'm going to eliminate those issues. Yeah, it's impressive. Um, I think when you think about it, right, you see all these people that, that, that have a negative thing to say about ethanol and things like that. Um, and then you go and you look at automotive manufacturers making flex fuel vehicles. Yeah. Today, you know, where you could just go to the pump, fill them up and drive them, park them and there's no issues. So. The flaw isn't with the fuel. The it's flaw a is set up and the user error. Yeah, and we utilize the fuel part. This engine is super overkill for me for what I'm doing. Um, so obviously, when you have a machine shop, I guess you. Yeah. You, so you it's machined. A, it's a little bit of a luxury. So it's you also never have any problems with uh, with blow by and all this stuff. And I think that's not like you take the machining of the block and. Um, like the cross hatching and stuff, you take it really seriously because most Absolutely. people really are like, oh, it's fine or this and that. People don't even know that there's variations in cross hatching and that it has to match up and all that stuff. Yeah. And you think that that's a big part in why you don't have any blow by or any, because yeah. I see people that run huge, like these, this is like a dash eight on your motor. I know guys that run like fucking dash 12 or some shit because they got so much blow by, so much crankcase problems. Um, there's so many guys at events that I run into that have huge crankcase ventilation problems. I think that like dash eight's a little bit frowned upon. I thought it looked a little bit cleaner, but I, I don't know. You know, like I said, I think it's preference. Um, I think that like if I could do it again, I would still push for 10, whether you need it or not. But yeah, we just don't, we're not dealing with a lot of crankcase pressures on the motors. And it's not to say that I've never put out a motor with blow by, we have. But the thing is, we go back, we fix it, we find the problems. Yep. And we work with companies like Total Seal that'll work with us, you know? Yeah. Like I said, we have this discussion where, like, if I, if I do have blow by yeah. with a Total Seal ring pack, that they'll, and, and I do everything correct. But see, that's the thing is, is that's where you have to use things like a profilometer to make sure that the grit you use is, is correct, you know? Right. Um, oftentimes you have grit ranges. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, cross hatch angles. Oftentimes with manual machines, this is a, this is a very common thing where, you're supposed to have a cross hatch angle and it's supposed to be top to bottom, but when you're running a manual machine, yeah. um, if you dwell a little too long in a spot, you could straighten them right back out, you know? Yeah. And um, these are things where you have, you know, I see it all the time where you have kind of those patterns where it's like straight and then you get your angle up and then it's straight again with a manual machine where my machine could put that perfect cross hatch angle yeah. all the way top to bottom every single time. Because that's um, like your seal comes from the cross hatch, of course, like the exactly. quality of your cross well, hatch. It's, it's, it's also the, abil it's the ability to retain oil as well. Right, that's and it. that's where your seal comes from is, is the cylinder wall's in inherent ability to retain oil right. um, and do its job. Yeah. So if it's too slick, it, it can't, you know? Yeah, especially uh, with like E85, you're gonna wash down the walls if you're, yeah. if you're wrong and you're gonna lose compression and you're basically doing everything wrong. You'll lose power, you'll add ethanol to your oil, um, you're, you're gonna get, you're gonna get crankcase problems. Like it's, it's like a, definitely a big pitfall. And like I said, it just depends, right? Like, so like uh, every motor's built a little bit differently. Like it depends on your horsepower level, what you're doing. Like I said, like the Corvette's a car that you could rail on and not, smell any uh, ethanol in the right. oil. The GTR is a very loosely built motor. You know, it's a, you know, factory block, factory stroke, 1600 horsepower car. So flying very close to the sun. Right. Uh, so you have to have things a little bit looser, but still you have a car with no blow by. Yeah. Um, and you do get a little bit of ethanol smell in the car, but you have to drive quite a bit to get it, you know? Right, right. Um, so, but you're not filling up catch cans or anything. But you're totally right. Like the, the factory so cars, it's possible. That, yeah, the factory cars that run ethanol don't have that. Like they don't have that problem. They the don't thing have. Is, is like yeah. when you think about like some of these stones that I that I use in my cylinder honer, very expensive. Um, and if you don't maintain them, you 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 mess them up with something. Um, I've seen. We've had it here where we've crashed uh, on accident, like them into a um, a torque plate. You know, we right. got aluminum in them. Like if we don't go. Yeah. And grind those stones down and refinish them and reface them. Like, uh, we're not going to get the right grit finish when we hone that block. Yeah. So it's just like sometimes, like, you're just not on top of things. You have apprentices or you have guys that don't care. Yeah. Someone's having an off day. Um, and that's why you have to use things like a profilometer to check your surface finishes and grits after the fact. Yeah. Uh, because, to make sure. Because I really think a lot of people don't know this. It's like one of those things that people don't even realize. The thing like any cross hatch is good and they check a block. Like, yeah, there's good cross hatching, but they don't even know, like, the different grades and, and, and yeah. the different specs that you have on it. I mean, sometimes like, like you know, like th this is this is why I, you know, um, though probably the most common issue that I see, right, is like uh, people not using torque plates. Oh yeah. Um, we don't even offer that as a service. Um, you're paying for a torque plate fee yeah. Yeah. or you gotta go somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense, but like I see this a lot where 
guys will take motors and they'll put ARP head studs and head gaskets in them because they feel like they're making the motor stronger. And I can assure you on a 2JZ, factory head studs, you can make, you can exceed the limits of the, the rotating assembly, everything else on the factory head studs. They're very good, but the problem is, is new OEM head studs could be yeah. around 360, yeah. 380 USD, ARP, yeah. a, a lot more. Yeah. So that's why people don't want to run them. But the problem is, is when you change the torque specs from the factory, when these things are, are honed from the factory and sized from the factory, they're torqued down and they're cut. So that way you have that simulation of a cylinder head. Um, when we machine, we have to do the same exact thing. So when you go and you change the torque specs, 20 foot pounds, let's just say, after the fact, that distorts all the material. Right. And that could be the difference between, um, in a Jay-Z, I don't think I've quite seen a thousandth, but I've seen close to it, like nine tenths, wow. like wow. right of, wow. of motion yeah. from the factory head stud to an ARP head stud using a torque right. plate. Right, man. Uh, uh, or just the torque plate being on versus it being off. So when you see how much that block can move, yeah. um, when you're using, let's just say a cast piston, right? Um, you're using a lot smaller, maybe two and a half thousandths piston to wall clearance. If you take a, th if you subtract a thousandth from that, yeah, you know, like you're, it's, it makes it very difficult, right? And, and so you add these distortions and these runouts into these cylinders, and the second you put ARP ha hardware in a motor, you're already outside of the factory window of runout in a cylinder of what the factory is even allowable. So I, I call it, I like to call it the lottery. Uh, and it's because I have guys like, uh, well, you, you just met Traver. His motors ran awesome for a long time. It's starting to get tired now, but he's ran several seasons with ARP head studs in his block and hasn't had too many issues. Yeah. But then so I also, what, what the spec next, is Trav, Travis's motor just in like one sentence? Uh, it's just a 1JZ, uh, GT3582, about 650, 700 right, horsepower. Right, yeah. um, so I mean, he's really given a factory motor all it has. Right. And he's been very fortunate with that motor. Yeah. I also have some motors here that I've taken in from customers where they didn't even get to an event because they started replacing these with ARP hardware thinking they were making improvements. Yeah. I have one here, the guy did ARP uh, main studs, ARP rod bolts, ARP head studs, and that motor, that car never ran. Right. It was a perfectly good running motor. Crazy. And it was just from all the distortion in the mains and things like that. It didn't want to turn over correctly. It was bi the crankshaft's binding up. Man. I mean, it's a huge difference. Uh, just everything, like measuring things and just being thorough. Uh, like, that's why like we build in a room and we try, we have a heater on there. We keep, try to keep everything yep. temperature controlled because yep. um, it's crazy how much like, like right now it's the weather's cold and that's why there's no machines on. Um, our, right now we're getting a new heater installed so that way we can get it up to temp, but we won't machine anything exactly. unless it's yeah. above 70 degrees because I could go from 70 degrees to 68 degrees on a block and I could see two, three tenths movement in right. a cylinder just from a two degree variation. Incre incredible. Um, I could go from, then I could go from 70 degrees to 120 and see no movement. Crazy. Uh, but it's when it's, things get cold yeah. that you start to see things start to move very fast. Um, I know we were doing a block uh, of a Ford V6 that this morning, or it was, I think it was yesterday morning, we were at like one, three, I think was like the lowest number on our mains. And we were supposed to be at like two, five. Um, so we're over a thousandth off on our, on, on our line board. Right. And by the time we had just brought in the build room and we just do that sometimes just to kind of like see where, how much things change. And from coming from the shop inside the build room and us letting it stabilize the temperature and the block getting up to 70 degrees, it actually opened up over a thousand in the main journal wow. to fit and, you know, and that's how big of a deal it is. Like when I say, when I tell people like, you know, you got to make sure your cars get up to temperature, operating temperature before you run them. Yeah, for uh, sure. Because numbers move around yeah. and you want them to be opened up as much as you can and where they want to be. So you don't want to be cooling your car down to 150 degrees and then going out on the track and railing on it. Uh, is that a lot of people do that to try, try to do that to compensate for inadequacies in your cooling system. Yeah. Well, let me get this thing really, really cold and it gives me a bigger window of operating time to run yeah. while I'm on the yeah, track exactly. versus just trying to find a way to make a cooling system. Like operate at, at, exactly. peak, at peak temperature, yeah. Because um, only one temperature is correct. Like everything else is like going to be less ideal. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But it's like it's sometimes it can be tough for people to maintain those temperatures. Yeah. I get it, but... Um, yeah, still, like you want to be as close, you want to make it as easy as, uh, as, easy as possible on yourself. 100%. So what, what compression ratio you run on this? Uh, 10 to 1. 10, so all right. I, on just about everything that I build, I run higher compression 
Um, especially with like, it feels like E85 and things yeah, like that. Yeah, so you can do that. Um, I think some of the ideas of like, um, you know, lower compression being safer and things like that. Um, I think some of those things are kind of going out the window a little bit. Um, because of like, able, uh, because of like ECU, no, like quality fuels, of ECU. But yeah, but like yeah. better tuning and things like that. Yeah. Um, some of that stuff is, a lot of it's kind of hinging on the fact that like, you're using a standardized tune across the board for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, and then once you start changing things, like the amount of volume a cylinder head can flow, uh, like, you know, larger cams, things like that, uh, you could get away with a lot more compression exactly. yeah. because those things will bleed off compression. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, 10 to 1 would be my static compression and then dynamic compression would be the actual compression the cylinder makes while operating. Yeah. So when you start adding things to it, cams, things like that, you start getting more aggressive, uh, oversized valves, you start opening up the ports, now your your dynamic compression starts to drop, so you want to bring up your static compression, um, and it's going to make things more responsive and, and yeah. things of that nature. So, uh, the, so you like to drive? They drive in your eyes. They drive way better with a little bit higher compression. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially once you put cams, in, it's important. Yeah. Uh, to have to you know, I see a lot of people they run thicker head guy, They try to bring the compression down. That's another big thing that blows my mind and makes no sense to me. Is um, I actually use. Uh, this motor has Cometic head gaskets. Probably 90% of the motors that we build here use Cometic head gaskets. I don't use any aftermarket head gaskets. And then the other 10% is probably going to be OEM. Um, and most of that is because customers specify that they want an OEM gasket. Right. Um, the common thing is, theme seems to be that the OEM head gasket is the best head gasket. Right. Um, it is such a phenomenal gasket um, that, yeah, it is tough to say no to that gasket. Uh, but with Cometic gaskets, they're very good gaskets as well. Um, I feel like I, the most important thing with running a Cometic gasket is making sure that you're servicing your block and your cylinder head and you're within the RA spec that they recommend for that gasket and you're never going to have an issue. Uh, but the reality of it is, is when you're look inside of a combustion chamber and the fuel is igniting, um, that flame is going to look for the weakest point. Right. Uh, and the weakest point is always going to be the gasket. Yeah. It's going to be the thinnest piece of material in there. So when you have issues like detonation, it's going to find the weak spots. It's going to burn the gasket first. So the thicker you make the gasket, the more surface area you give that gasket, right. the easier it is for it to burn that gasket out. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just definitely think that like it, it, it stems from, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too, but this stems from kind of like old school, I think Japanese... A culture, a technology, like kind of who we followed coming yeah. up, you know, yeah. seeing like, oh, thicker head gasket, it makes it safer. We're just like uh, 20, 20, is, is 30 years Exactly. Ago. It was yeah. the technology that they were using to tune these vehicles with too. Exactly. And so they were trying to bring the compression down, yeah. makes things a little bit safer. So it's uh, like a whole universe of things that lead to something that's not necessarily true today well, anymore. I mean, we're looking at ve factory vehicles right now that are coming out with turbochargers that are... 10 and a half, 11, 11 and a half, even yeah. in some cases 12 to one oh, yeah. from the factory. Um, but like most of them will be- they're more efficient. But do you think like the direct, like the BMWs run pretty high, like the 335i and 54? The direct injection yeah. as it plays a role. Exactly, because that's the thing. And um, But like on the other end, on a race car, you'll probably have more um, adjustability in your tune and it doesn't have to make any emissions 100%. or so you could and and you you could run like better fuel like if a, if an oem manufacturer makes a car they need to make it for shitty fuel like 87 arizona fuel so they'll yeah. need it and on a race car you could probably get away with that compression with like the higher the better quality fuel well, you with run. fuels you you have so much room for compression yeah um like i said i like my cars to have a little compression i like them to be more responsive um, and like I said, I think the biggest figure that people don't calculate in engines is uh, dynamic compression oh, versus for static. Oh, sure, for sure. Uh, so you yeah. really don't know, yeah. right? So these car, you know, with these guys, engineers know what they're doing. They're, they're designing these motors, and when they engineer these engines. Um, so what do you think about the VVTi and the dynamic compression? Do you think that could have any negative effect on it, running the VVTi or not running the VVTi for um, your dynamic compression? No, like I said, the, 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 that's up to the tuner, right? Like when the VVTi kicks in and how it works and when it engages. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe so at all, right? Um, I think that the effectiveness of the VVTi, especially throughout the range, is going to be um, varied by the actual profile of the camshaft as well, right? 
And I think that's what's really going to affect. And that, I think there is some adjustment there where you could compensate. Like, let's just say you have too much dynamic compression where you could compensate for that a little bit um, if, if it's not kind of working with the fuel. And you, you, you're you given a little bit more wiggle room where you could be a little bit more aggressive in some places to help with spool. Um, there's small right. differences. Right. Uh, the, the, the VVTI system in this isn't as advanced or, or isn't as uh, complex, I guess, as like uh, some like a VTEC or something, you know, where it's like a completely changing the cam profile. Right, yeah. You're just making minor adjustments. So there's small yeah. things, but the VVTI definitely helps considerably. Uh, but like I said, its ability to work is based off of the profile of the camshaft as right. well. Right, right. Um, so when you're looking at that, like, uh, um, like I said, that's what's the main defining factor in your dynamic compression is going to be how much lift it has, how much duration it has, yeah. uh, these things like that that are going to affect it. And like I said, the, the longer you, um, leave the valve open, the more overlap, things like that, 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 that come in those equations or those variables can bleed off compression through the compression stroke cycle. And that's what can change your dynamic compression. Right. So, and that's why I usually push to do like at least like nine to one if it's mildish and you're using a mild cam. Yeah. But if you're going to be using more aggressive cams, I always go straight to 10 to one. Yeah. Um, there's really no exception for that because I feel like uh, there's advantages there. And I think that realistically, you're not gaining a ton of dynamic compression you're kind of offsetting the fact that you're losing some right. uh, with a more aggressive right. camshaft. Right. Yeah, that's the whole deal. So you, that's so it's more yeah. of a balancing act. And it's going to be a way cooler. It probably sounds cooler. It's exactly. nicer to, if you, you go off your, throttle. You don't want yeah. your engine to be lazy either. No, you know? like if you go, I like it if I go off throttle that the engine is like sort of like almost like a brake, you know. And that's what yeah. I like on the like my V8 is like reasonably high compression. If I let off the throttle, like the car really slows down. And if you run like a car like a standard two JC is eight and a half. So if you let off the throttle, it really doesn't slow down much. And I kind of like that in battles and stuff that the motor also kind of works like a brake. You don't have to touch the brakes because judges don't like to watch to watch the Absolutely. brake lights go on. Yeah. Um, having compression is definitely very beneficial. A lot of modern engines, like I said, there's a lot, the, the, the way they're engineered today, um, they flow, their head, solar heads flow a lot more volume, yeah. things like that, areas where they can bleed off dynamic compression to run more uh, static compression so that way um, they can make these engines more efficient, yeah. uh, more responsive, things like that. So you're seeing more of that technology being used by automotive manufacturers today. Yeah. Um, so we try to implement some of that, you know, where applicable. Yeah. Um, but like I said, if I know someone's only running 91 octane and that's it, yeah. and they're not going, and they're not, they're running a stage one cam or something like that, uh, we try to stay away from yeah. um, too much compression. You know, we'll right. just, we'll, you know, nine to one is. Uh, acceptable at that point, but um, the car is responsive as possible, and then I'll fill in the void with boost later on. Yep. But like I said, it also depends, right? But like with some of these, we've talked about turbos, like more like modern, efficient turbos. Yeah. Um, you know, some of that void, you know, especially once you get into race gas, that that can be filled by turbos. But some of these more efficient turbos, um, they spool so quick, and they're not very efficient up top. They don't breathe well up top. Right. And you wind up having to go to larger and larger turbos. So if you're really maxing out the efficiency of that turbo. You're making so much power. Yeah. Um, so that's why, like on these, like for me personally, I use uh, smaller turbos. I use Borg Warner turbos, general yeah. bearing turbos, because there's no advantage. Right. I can make 650, 700 horsepower and hit full boost in a, in a one to one gear by 36, 3700 RPM, no problem. Yeah. Right. That's so easy to do, and have you know a large power band because you know with, some, with something like this, I'm not afraid to rev to 8000 RPM. And if you have like your compression ratio, it's also going to affect the way the turbo spools and your cam is going to be, play a big role. Like other people, they kind of forget that like the way the exhaust cam works, it's also going to affect the way the turbo works. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a big thing. And it's kind of nice that you can run like, a, yeah, maybe a little cheaper, a little more si simple turbo just because you run more compression. Uh, yeah. And the thing is, is, I used to run, I mean, I, sometimes I run them on stock motors too, you know, like yeah. uh, um, is there a big difference in driving them, like on an eight and a half compression to a 10, 10 to one compression? It makes, it makes less difference than you would think. Really? Uh, you know, like there, there could be, like I said, it depends on the cam profile. So like right. on this motor, I wanted to step up a little bit, but I wanted to keep my spool down. So I ran with a little bit milder profile cam than I might have typically ran uh, with the compression. But like I said, as you go up at more aggressive, it's just pairing things up. Right. Uh, pairing the cam to the compression to the turbo. And things like that you can kind of fine-tune a little bit there um, some people don't really want to get that technical and they just throw it on it works so if I yeah. have to throw a couple extra clutch kicks at it oh yeah uh, so be it you know what I'm yeah, saying yeah. Uh, but everyone's different you know, like I said, everyone's goals are different 
everyone's car set up so uniquely, it's kind of hard to find like a one size fits all yeah. uh, formula. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I definitely use, you know, some, wherever I can, I use more cost effective components. Uh, whether I can afford it or whether I have a machine shop or whatever it is, um, I, I try to use the component that's size that's right for the application. And, um, like I said, like certain things I believe, um, if I can get away with it, you know, like I said, if I was driving FD, we would have a different conversation. Uh, but for me, for 500 horsepower or 600 horsepower, yeah. uh, you know, running a, a journal bearing turbo uh, that I could just change the core out every season or something like that and not care. And yeah. I could throw the other one in the trash and yeah. keep going. And it's super cost effective. Super reliable. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it winds up being cost effective because sometimes things happen anyways. Sure. I wind up eating up the expensive ones. And like I said, I'm getting the power band I want. Like my goal is about 4,000 um, to 4,500. I'd like to stay a little bit above, like 42 to 4,500 is my goal. Um, if I could stay around there, I, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge power band. It makes it drive very aggressive and uh, uh, very, I could shift lazier and stuff like that. Yeah. I like doing, um, you know, a lot of like, uh, you know, upshifts, like early upshifts and things like yeah. that. If yeah. I can upshift to initiate things like that. Yeah. So like, um, I like doing that, like doing that a lot, driving, you know, as aggressive with as much wheel speed as I can. Uh, so it's nice having that a little bit of torque there down low too, uh, so kind of creating a good a good mixture. Cool. Um, so I like having the, the drivability as well. Yeah, I don't like no. having a, a. I guess it just depends. It's situational. Sometimes, like I said, that's why I have a lot of different cars too, because every car kind of serves a different purpose. For right. Me, you know. Sometimes I like having a laggier car, something that can rev a little bit higher. Um, I know we talked about that, like some of the other stuff I'm building, the, the VVLs and things like that. Yeah. Other cars, and like I said, it's like. Um, so that way I kind of mix it up a little bit. I like cars where I have to drive really aggressive sometimes. I like the low horsepower cars. Yeah, I just sure. like to... Um, but this is going to be such a fun package. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We also absolutely. talked a little bit about clutch size and flywheel size. Like, mm -hmm. we seem to think about that the same way, that you don't want to have a super light flywheel, super light clutch in these no. motors. You absolutely. want to have a, a little weight there, a little actual flywheel action. Especially so, with turbo motors. Yeah. Um, you don't want things to rev quicker. Yeah. Um, you like it doesn't like just because it revs quicker it doesn't mean it loads up as well exactly. especially down low especially when we're talking about like boost characteristics things like that oh yeah faster isn't better yeah always so, I've been trying to advocate that for years yeah absolutely um, so we use like um, certain rods like uh, we prefer you know like I use a lot of manly stuff uh, it just depends on what it is if I can justify it we go to do a lot of Korea stuff uh, oh, yeah. very good products um, American products. We yeah. push some BC stuff here and there too. Um, you know, like I said, we mix it up quite a bit. Um, I've got some new stuff. I think Weissel came out with a raw that looks pretty promising. That I want to try. That's pretty heavy. Um, yeah. We try so to use heavier duty four exactly. gears wherever wherever yeah. possible. Um, I think like one of my favorite ones is um, CP. Um, yeah. So I actually have a full range. Um, I don't have it up for sale right now, uh, but uh, we have a full range of custom CP pistons. And like standard forging and the HD forging, the heavier ones, uh, with topper thick, or, uh, thick, thicker top ring lands. Yeah. Uh, so 1.2 millimeters uh, and total steel rings. Uh, it's kind of out of the scope of like what kind of CP likes. Uh, but like I said, they're mine, so I get yeah. to do whatever the hell I want. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I and I keep a range of those because they're a little bit heavier of a piston. Yeah. So we're going to like uh you know larger boost levels, um, higher horsepower motors. I try to push those CPs because. Um, they're a heavier piston, a heavier forging. Uh, there's more reciprocating weight. Uh, we're adding some weight in the ring lands, places where that are beneficial, um, and they're just a stout, a stout package. Yeah. And then we'll pair those with the rods appropriate. To, yeah. So you're uh, rotating your whole, like your rotating assembly, your flywheel, your clutch. You all want that to hit a certain weight. Yeah. Uh, I always just use to... full size. I think this one's a clutch masters. Um, I have quite a few clutch masters. Uh, uh, that's. You know, I'm not gonna say it's my favorite clutch, but it's definitely it's a really good clutch. Yeah. Um, I use a lot of that. I use Tilton. Um, I, I mix it up a lot on, on my different builds. I like trying things. Yeah, and sure. I like working with companies, see how they work, how they deal with customer service, yeah. things like that. Like yeah. all of it adds to the experience for, for me. For sure. Yeah. Uh, but I love the the, cl the, the clutch masters. I use the full with the eight and a half inch, the heavier twin mm -hmm. plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. We take a we try to take as little weight, a rotating weight mass off. Yeah. Um, in some situations, you can get away with it. Uh, going to a super light setup is not very beneficial in a turbo no. application like this. Especially in um, the lower gears, it's just not ever going to build exactly. boost. Yeah. In a situation like this, um, 
you know, we, when we balance this rotating assembly, so like this crankshaft, right, it gets balanced, uh, we make sure that it's within spec. Um, and then once, it's, once we check it for straightness, we balance it, everything's within spec. Uh, since it's an inline crankshaft, we don't actually use bob weights. Right. Um, so we make sure everything's within spec, and then we go back and we bolt everything to the crankshaft. So the, I think that's one exception to the rule where you could get away with a little bit less rotating weight um, is when you're building an engine, you have the ability to balance because yes. um, even though these are neutral balance items, uh, usually we, we, the actual hanging weight uh, can actually affect the internal balance. Right. Um, so when you subtract hanging weight, it can actually alter things. Um, so that's what we do. We go, we verify that these items are in fact neutral balance within spec yeah. after the cranks are balanced. And then we verify that the hanging weight is not going to throw the actual crankshaft balancing out of balance. Right, right. Um, so uh, that's where like another big thing is like when we're changing clutches, like it's always ideal to have those things balanced to your rotating surface so you can verify. Uh, but yeah, staying similar in weight is huge for just about every application. Oh, yeah. Uh, that where you're not pulling the crankshaft out, you're not altering everything because yeah. uh, balancing is a big deal with these motors, with any motor in general. And if, if you like add a supercharger to a car, like that's driven off the crank, so you're also putting a little bit of force on the crank over there. I, mean, I, I do see bad products. I do see, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but like, because I'm obviously like a, a JDM nerd, right? But like, uh, all these Japanese companies I've seen, you know, like it, it's changing now. See, a lot of these Japanese products, clutches and stuff like that, they, they don't have a single balancing mark. They oh. don't have a locating mark for the pressure oh, plate. Oh, man. And you're just kind of like, Ooh. and, and yeah. I'm just like, oh, well, you know, like the thing is, it's like that could destroy a motor. For sure. If that stuff isn't balanced correctly, yeah. it could just, that could destroy your motor. Or it, could, or it could, could come into the cabin or come through your scuttle panel, or that's also like Absolutely. something you don't want to do. That's, a, that's like obviously worst case scenario, but yeah, if, if, if you throw a flywheel or a harmonic balancer, I see that a lot. Guys will be like, oh, I want to dress my motor up, and they'll put the like Chinese billet, like a harmonic balance oh, on, yeah, on yeah. their motor. Oh yeah, for looks, yeah. Uh, and then they're, they're, you're taking that weight off the front of the engine. Yeah. That thing is not balanced. No. Um, and then you're just taking life off of your motor. Oh, for sure. Uh, you're increasing the harmonics. Yeah. And, and the your, speed your, of your 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 rod bearings, your all your bearings are gonna have a weight off for job. I see all kinds of stuff like, uh, you know, even with this, you know, about this, uh, we've been testing it. But um, switching to a rib pulley here, but we just use the factory tensioner because we don't want to put an excess of tension on this because that's going to pull the crankshaft the wrong direction. We're going to have less clearance on one side of the front bearing than we are the other. Right. So we want to make sure that we can't over tension these things. And I'll be honest with you, if I could, you know, like 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 eventually once we do this, like I would love to like upgrade some of these to like rib pulleys, like time belt style pulleys or to, to belts. Rather yeah. than uh, th these these ribs, yeah. So like a horizontal instead of a vertical exactly. rib, yeah. Uh, just so I could run things looser. Looser, yeah. Uh, so just you're so not I'm not pulling, pulling anything on that crankshaft. Especially if you want to do some RPMs with a motor, like it's going to multiply like crazy. If you do like 8k RPM, and Absolutely. that's definitely a thing that people. That, it but it's interesting if I talk to you. There's so much stuff that um, people overlook. Like there, it's like assumption. Like we talked about on the on the machining. Like the assumptions that people do. Like oh, this guy runs that pulley or this guy runs that clutch or it's gonna it's gonna go through the revs real fast and like yeah it just speaks volumes that you uh that you that you do this stuff the way yeah, you do I, I have a way that i like to do things you know and, and, and i think for me like um you know I, I think one of the ways i like to explain things to a lot of people is is like uh, uh because i get kind of questioned all the time on suggestions i make because i am kind of hypercritical of certain things because I always have to look at the perspective of like, would I be able to stand behind and support this? Uh, but sometimes like the things I say and do or, or recommend aren't always what works. Yeah. Sometimes people get away with more, but like, yeah. I just can't be on the side of just getting away with something. Yeah, no, it's I true. have to know without a doubt that this is going to work in your vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and I need guarantees, I need sure things as much as possible yeah. because if I'm constantly having to support things, I can't make any money. If I can't make any money, I can't be here to support anybody. Yeah. And the thing um, is also that if things don't fail, like people drive, what, like four, five, maybe six events a year. They do like maybe between 10 and 30 laps and then it doesn't fail. And then like, yeah, you see it works, but it doesn't. It just, you just got away with it, you know. You don't know like how bad it could have been. It's better to be. Sometimes yeah. you, just, you just don't know. Yeah. So having those margins for errors, those little things built in, yeah. Um, and like I said, the thing is, 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 is like, just like we talked last time, man, like, uh, there's a lot of things that, about the way I build things that's just super cut and dry. Yeah. There's certain things that just work. Like, 
that were engineered, right? Like, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a metallurgist, I'm a machinist, right? So it's hard for me to take certain stance, stances on things, right? Like, if I'm not a metallurgist, I can't tell you a process of, of tempering or heat treating a metal and forging and, 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 and the actual breakdown of the metal is gonna be capable of handling 600 horsepower versus 900 horsepower. Um, that's not in my wheelhouse and that's not in any machinist's wheelhouse. We're not metallurgists, you know? Right. Uh, so real, realistically, like, uh, you have to rely on, on uh, your manufacturers and you, and you have to make sure that you ask the correct the question the correct questions you ask right. in the correct way uh, sometimes too which is kind of a like i said a tricky kind of not so great side of that uh, of the industry where sometimes you get the wrong person on the phone and you don't answer the question the right way you're like yeah sure yeah, yeah you know, right that'll work yeah. um it was just like the, the manly rod thing where it's like you know like i could see i could have a rod that's rated for 900 horsepower yeah and then i dig it up in their catalog and it says circle track yeah 600 and it ends up to be 600 and, 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 and then you thought you yeah. had support yeah and then that thing breaks and you call them back and you don't, Yeah. right? And um, that's the problem. So, I mean, we've actually done that. I actually had a customer stretch a set of those out. Yeah. Uh, and they were manly H beams, they were H tufts, and they were rated for 900. And that's that's why like, I, it stuck in my head. Yeah. Uh, because when they were rated for 900, I found that they were 600, I said they wouldn't work, the customer wanted to run them, and they stretched them out. Right. And uh, yeah. And uh, it wasn't good, you know? And uh, it took it took time it wasn't like instantly yeah you know no, but, but that's it um, yeah you're talking about a thousand uh, almost a thousand wheel horsepower car you know too you yeah know? um so nowhere near was that ever rated for those types yeah. of force yeah um and also too is, is you know um we went with you know it was just a bad combination you know we went he wanted a heavy duty piston so he ran a heavy duty cp piston right he added more weight on the end of the rod and you add more weight on the end of the rod and you use a heavier rod. Right. Um, so like I said, there's combinations that are tried and true that work and sometimes people want to stray away from that and that's just something that we're, we're learning and we're trying to get away from in our shop is you know, saying no like, to people because um, it sucks to say that to people because I want to help everybody but sometimes yeah. you know, like uh, it, you wind up um, on the wrong side of things with people and, and, right. and doing yeah. and damage and things like that. And, yeah. Um, I like being able to take responsibility for what I yeah, do, and I like. Well, that's really when rare. My customers yeah. are like happy that we, you know, like. Uh, yeah, that's rare. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. that's the whole thing. Like, it's it's not just about money. It's also about who you are in life and how you want to live your life and what kind of person you want to be. Well, the thing is too is like I understand it because I do it all the time. I run inferior products and test things and do shit all the time, and it breaks, and I feel like an idiot, man. Yeah. But the thing is, it's my own fault. But I'm like, a, I'm stubborn. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I understand where that person's coming from. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's why I'm like, I gotta help this individual. But like, yeah. that's the problem. Sometimes I have to learn when to say no. Yeah. And be like, no, I can't help you because I know this isn't gonna work. Yeah. Um, and even though like you're willing to accept responsibility for it, I don't want to be associated with those those damages because oh, I, yeah. it winds up looking ba reflecting bad on me anyway. So yeah, like I said, it. we kind of have our ways that we've settled into. Yeah. Uh, that's been working with these motors and, yeah. and, and working for us. And, yeah, well, you uh, seem to be the go-to guy. Thank you so much for uh, all the explaining. Uh, definitely uh, a lot of eye-openers there. So thank you very much, man. Absolutely.